Women in Leadership brought to you by Heron Code, the management consultancy for what happens next. For more information, you can visit heroncode.com. The Herring Code Women in Leadership podcast, season three. Welcome back. Thank you for listening to the season so far. I'm your host, Nimi Mehta. In today's episode, we are joined by an award-winning serial impact entrepreneur and philanthropist with over 19 years of experience. Uh, we've got her right here in the studio. She's sitting opposite me. She looks wonderful. Jamana Al Darwish, how are you? I'm great. Yeah? Thank you so much for well, having me. <laughs> look, this is your first podcast in person. Absolutely. So I hope I hope we do you justice. Amazing. And we have so much to talk about um, because I look at you and I'm and I'm confused as to how much experience you have. You look so young. You've done so much. I'm not young. Really? <laughs> well, you look young. You look fantastic. Uh, and you've you've achieved so much. So I wanna I wanna get to what you have achieved and I also wanna understand how you achieved it and what helped you get there sure. in the first place. So Born and raised here in the UAE? No, actually. Um, so I was born in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a diplomat. Okay. And so we lived in 11 countries. So growing up, I moved around quite a lot. I am originally Jordanian. Okay. Um, but I've only lived in Jordan for a few years throughout my upbringing. Um, and, but I still feel very much tied to, to home and to my people. Um, so it's been a great privilege and honor to see the world mm. from different angles, to meet different people, to learn different languages. Um, it gives you a very holistic experience and you become much more open mm. and welcoming to others as well. Mm, so, absolutely. Yeah. And so your dad being a diplomat. So what do you learn from that from, from a young age? So you learn, you learn to be uh, accepting, I think, um, and be open to new experiences. So like I said, I went to, I lived in 11 countries, so I would have to always move around. And, you know, I was always the new kid in every school. And what that gives you is a level of resilience and strength and openness. And also it gives you perspective on mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and different cultures and communities. Um, I think it was because of, of his role and my family's role that I kind of carved this journey in life, which mm -hmm. was based on impact because my family were very impact based with the work that they did. So um, from a young age, and I know this sounds very utopian, but I kind of knew what I wanted to do in this mm -hmm. world. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I set out to do it. Um, my educational kind of journey was based on impact and social development. So I have an undergraduate from Concordia University in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Then I'm then I got a master's from Oxford University, mm -hmm. and it was on evidence-based social intervention. So I kind of, through that educational uh, path, I was able to get an amazing job working for the royal court in Jordan. Mm -hmm. So um, I worked for Queen Rania's office of mm -hmm. Jordan, Her Majesty's office, and then I moved to work for His Highness Sheikh Hamad's office, the executive office here, on multiple projects. So I, I was a public servant for a good 10 years wow. before jumping ship into the insane world of entrepreneurship, <laughs> yeah. which, um, you know, has been a really incredible wild ride yeah. um, and so many learnings from that. But mm. I think, you know, just going back to your question, it really was because of that upbringing mm. that has enabled me to try different things and not be scared to, you know, to put my, to try being in the public sector, the private sector, or mm. even in the nonprofit world. So mm. um, it gives you a different perspective yeah, to life. Yeah, absolutely. And and you as a, as a young woman, as a young lady back then, how would you have described yourself as a personality? Um, so when I was younger, I was definitely an introvert, mm -hmm. very much. I was extremely sensitive, very much an introvert, but very strong as well. Mm. Um, I had a lot of aspirations to wanting to change the world at yeah. a very young age. So, like I said, it's very utopian. But I think because my family are so supportive and the fact that, you know, although I come from a Jordanian family and we're very, you know, we're very uh, kind of conservative, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're Arabs at the end of the day. That upbringing, um, my father was a feminist. So I grew up with a very strong a fatherly figure who believed in the power of a woman mm -hmm. and an educated woman. Mm -hmm. um, my mother as well is an extremely powerful woman. So when you grow up, although your culture is a little bit conservative, 
I grew up with a family that was very much pro, pro, pro. You can achieve everything that you want. Mm-hmm. If you put your mind to it and you work hard. Mm-hmm. Um, so that ethic, ethics at the beginning, the work ethic was really instilled in me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I attribute that to my family. Mm. Yeah. Was that quite alien? Was that quite against the norm that it, there was an Arab family that were so, you know, ahead of ahead of the time, essentially? Very much, I think... Um, It's also because we lived in so many countries growing Mm. up. So we weren't your typical Arab family, although Mm. we are quite, you know, with the norms and the values of our society. But I think it was that perspective of being open again to different cultures, different communities, different ways of doing things. Education has always been very profound in my family. Um, And growing up, you know, my father, I, I I still remember this and I tell this story all the time because it really impacted my my upbringing. But I remember I was about seven years old or really young or even six years old. And I went up to my father and I have four brothers okay. and one sister. And all my I'm the baby in the family. Uh-huh. So between me and the eldest is 19 years. And wow. between me and the youngest one out of their group, 13 years. Mm. Same mom, same dad. Wow. <laughs> But I was the baby and the mistake. Mm. And so I remember seeing my brothers get dressed up and going out and And I would go to my father and I would cry. I would be like, I wish I was a boy, you know. And so he looked at me straight in his blue eyes, gorgeous aqua blue eyes. And he said, Jumana, your greatest power is the fact that you are a woman and an educated woman. Mm -hmm. And that just resonates clearly with me. And I I take his words and I take and I attribute I attribute um, all who I am to my parents because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's beautiful. (laughs) Uh, And again, like I said, ahead of its time, because, you know, the world we live in now, that's so normal. Yeah. You know, that's so normal to hear and to instill in the generation. Um, So let's talk about the education side. Sure. Were you academic or did you have to work super, super hard? Um, So I was always... uh, I was always academic. Mm. I was always, I love learning. Yeah. I love it so much to a point where I even started my master's in Cambridge now. Wow. (laughs) So because I believe that we're all on a journey of learning and it's not, you don't stop at just, you know, bachelor's or master's or whatever it is that you decide. Mm -hmm. I think life gives you opportunities and if you take them and you, you know, it just grows your bandwidth and you yeah. expand. Um, and that's why I even just started my doing my master's now in entrepreneurship in, in Cambridge because mm-hmm. I'm like, why not? You yeah. know, mm-hmm. although I'm 42 and I'm probably mm-hmm. at the, you know, the greater age spectrum in the, in the cohort, <laughs> but I feel very privileged and honored to be able to learn and be in an academic setting because mm-hmm. it just, it, it widens your horizon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you and knowledge is power. Uh, knowledge is so, <laughs> so powerful. And, and you know, experience is so powerful as well. And that experience that you got uh, with Her Highness in Her Highness uh, Queen Rania's office, what did you learn from those days? A lot. Mm. So I was, I, I worked at her office at a very young age. So I was exposed to a lot. I was part of the international uh, relations uh, department. Mm-hmm. And so you know, just kind of in terms of champ- the, ch- the goals that she champions, um, her positioning power globally. Mashallah, she's, you know, she's a woman that we all aspire to be mm-hmm. uh, from both academia and the way she she is as a human being. She's yeah. very, very, very human. Um, so I was very honored and privileged to have served and worked for, for her, her majesty, Queen Rania. But also, I believe that you know, once you work in a setting like that, everything is possible and everything mm-hmm. is achievable. And that transcended to my work for His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin mm-hmm. Rashid al-Maktoum, where by being in that environment, it just gave me the ability to to think bold and bigger. And everything is achievable if yeah. you really put your heart and your energy into it. Um, by working on multiple kind of projects here, including Dubai Cares mm-hmm. and Dubai School of Government and Mohammed bin Rashid Maktoum Foundation, by working in that sector, in that space, you know, the ability to think of things and then bring them to life, Mm. but in a bold way, Mm. gives you that Russian energy like no other. And I think we're all very honored to be in Dubai for that, Mm -hmm. for that purpose. Yeah. Um, And I remember when I first came here, I was like, you know, I'll stay here for a year, two years, yeah. we'll see how it goes. And then here I am 17 years later, it is very much home. Mm. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here. Yeah. And, and you know, during, during your time within these offices, tell me how it was to be a woman uh, during this time. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, 
Dubai, I feel like has been moving. It's been moving for a very, very long time. You were a young woman who was gaining experience on the mm -hmm. job, essentially, gaining leadership skills on the job. How was that for you during that time? It was incredible. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, I never felt that my gender hindered my progress in any way possible. And that stems from also my learnings as a child. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, perhaps, um, you know, other women in different countries in, in the Middle East may feel that way. I've never felt that way. Yeah. I've had amazing mentors who are men. Um, amazing doors have opened up for me because of, you know, my abilities to, um, whether it's to communicate, mm. to do business, to do partnerships. So I've been very fortunate to have, ha have had amazing mentors and still have amazing mm. mentors who, who are, you know, who are men who are yeah. just phenomenal. Mm. Um, yeah. And and so let's speak about those mentors, because I think, I mean, uh, it's absolutely essential for anyone's career mm -hmm. or industry or just in a personal life, mm -hmm. whether whether your mentor is your grandma, or, you know, your aunt, whoever it is. Yeah. I think it's so essential. Mm -hmm. Did you carve that intentionally or did it organically just happen for you where the right people were around I you? I think the moment that you ask for help, you'll receive help. Mm. And that's what many women or men don't do. You know, mm. we have this... Um, you know, sometimes people are scared to ask for help. Yeah. It's you become vulnerable mm. to ask for help. And a lot of it is fear of rejection. But I think when you put that out there in the universe, yeah. it comes to you mm. and doors start to open up. So I was very open to help, open to feedback, open to ideas. And that's why I had incredible humans that came my way that helped support me in every way possible and especially when I jumped into the world of entrepreneurship mm. um I remember my first business you know I I actually I, I started the happy box that was like my first business launched it 10 years ago so yeah. this is wow. we're coming up to our 10th year Amazing. of uh, of magical sparkles yeah. and and happiness mm. so I found a way to package happiness mm. through the happy box and it is um it's an educational um entity which helps Kind of promote cognitive learning and, and development, mm -hmm. but also it brings families and communities together through the love of art and education. So it's a very beautiful concept. Um, and I started it on my dining room table. And I remember because it was product based, we needed a logistics arm to help mm -hmm. support us. And I remember, you know, one of the first people that I reached out to was Fadi Rendour, mm -hmm. who is the founder of Aramex. And I said, I, you know, could you help me? And he's like, of course. And he put me in touch with you know, with basically the country manager at the time, and he was Hussein Wahbe. And I'll never forget his kindness and the kindness of his team, mm. um, where they just opened up doors for me. And all of a sudden, you know, I went from an idea to having a logistics partner on the ground to help, wow. you know, move my products to from B to C. Mm. So having those opportunities are just incredible. Yeah. yeah. And if you hadn't have asked, if you hadn't exactly. have reached out, who I could knows? have I could have just you know, kept to myself and found different ways and probably lost a lot of funds and, and money throughout that time, time, yeah. resources and energy. But I was very lucky to have been kind of, you know, embraced and, and the support was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to rewind a tiny sure. bit. Go for it. To where you took the leap to go into entrepreneurship, yeah. because most people, some people would sit cozy <laughs> with a, you know, solid, solid income salary coming in mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm good. I don't mm -hmm. need to push it any further. What was it inside of you? Like, what was your voice telling you, your inner voice as to why you need to switch it up and go into a different direction? Oh, God, it's I know it's going to sound bizarre, but mm. um, literally. So I had a very stable job. I loved what I was doing. Mm. Um, I was the head of corporate planning and development at Dubai Cares, loved my peers, loved loved the, what the mandate stood for. Mm. Um, but I had just become a new mom. Mm. So my daughter was born and, you know, and the thing is, I'm an expat here, mm -hmm. essentially. Like, I don't have my extended family here or, you know, the support that you would normally get in terms of, when the family is there. Yeah. And so although I had great help and I was I'm very fortunate mm. and thankful for that. It's just I was missing out on important um, milestones in her life, be yeah. it her first biscuit or, you know, first this or first that. And I just thought, you know, I really I really wanted to shift. And mm. at that time, I had just turned 30. I was going through something called Saturn returns. It's mm. when you start assessing things in your life mm -hmm. and actually 
you know, just read about it. It's really interesting. You start making massive changes. It's like career changes happen or personal changes happen. Mm. Um, And I woke up one night in the middle of the night and I felt like I could move mountains. I felt like that energy, that rush. I felt I was ready to leave a legacy. Mm. And what was that legacy is starting something of impact. Um, And that's when I took that leap of faith. And I'm so grateful and lucky to to be able to have done that. Mm. Um, So yeah, so I started my first business dining room table concept. It moved to the garage. And from Mm. the garage, we have now a studio space at Sirkal Avenue. Wow. We've had it for seven years now. It features our factory for the happy box. And then the happy studio is a space where we do activations Mm. and events and, and workshops for kids and it's just, you know, you go from a dream to a reality. Yeah. And you you look back and now it's been 10 years. 10 wow. years for the Happy Box, 7 years for the Happy Studio. And I look back and I'm like, wow. Yeah. This is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> this is really cool. And it looks amazing 10 years after. But there is a lot of work that goes into this. Yes. It's not built overnight. No. I feel like people have kind of also... It's glamorized it. glamorized it's it. not glamorous <laughs> no your elon musks you know you see the finished product yeah. you don't see the years that were put in to to making something successful during that journey i want to take you to like the first year of when you did this how challenging was that time for you it was so intense to a point where my family all thought i was going through a crisis mm. <laughs> Wow. And they were like, hmm, this is really odd. <laughs> Does she need help? <laughs> Does yeah. she need help? So no one in my family is an entrepreneur. Okay. So we're either academics or we're, you know, you know, either government, non-government. Mm-hmm. Um, although my brothers are, you know, they're engineers. So it's just no one has actually been an entrepreneur. So mm-hmm. when I told my mom I was starting the Happy Box, she was like, is this a phase? Yeah. (laughs) She's like, okay, try it for three months and then go back. Mm. You know, you have an amazing job. You're doing so well. You're, you know, on paper, it just looked so perfect, right? The perfection of, of, you know, it was a career development. Everything was going my way. And then I was like, you know, I really want to try this. Mm. And literally the first, I think, I don't know, six weeks, we had like, 12 franchise requests, something like that globally. Although I was like still running it from my dining room table. Um, And then I got the the first franchise request was from a guy in Brazil that (laughs) that loved the concept. And he was like, wow. And I think it goes back to timing. So Mm -hmm. I launched a product or let's say, um, you know, a brand at a time where it was needed. Mm. So there was a need, you know, there was an influx of of families moving to the UAE. Mm-hmm. Um, there was, you know, children are are based here. Yeah. Um, so families were being forged here, especially from the migrants. Mm-hmm. And so my product was is a, is a happy product alone, yeah. but also it's one that is extremely beneficial for bringing families together mm-hmm. through art. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took a concept which is probably very standard in the US mm-hmm. or Europe, which are subscription boxes, arts and crafts for kids and then I kind of revolutionized it here Mm. and so it was all about timing it came at the right time and that's why there was an influx of interest and of support and partnerships that were developed Mm. and then the journey just went from there so yeah and it was really intense yeah it was really intense lots of sleepless nights lots of uh, trial and error here and there lots of resources were lost essentially Mm. Uh, this is self-funded, so I refuse to take any funding from anyone, mm. and I just went with it, you know? Yeah. And so um, you learn a lot. Mm. You learn the tangible, uh, you know, the whole process of entrepreneurship is very glamorized, and it's it shouldn't be because mm. you have your highs and your lows. And I think anyone who's been an entrepreneur, especially during COVID, Mm -hmm. knows how difficult it was to sustain. And if you were able to get through a situation like that, a global phenomenon like Mm -hmm. that, you can get through anything. Mm -hmm. So it really tests your limits. And you as a human, you as a leader, you as as a visionary as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you have momentum and you're growing and, Mm -hmm. you know, within your six weeks getting 12 franchise (laughs) offers, I mean... It's going at a pace that maybe you yourself didn't even yes. foresee happening. How 
how do you deal with that? Because nothing can quite prepare you mm -hmm. for that. There, there was no, you know, course that you could do. There was no uh, quick thing that or quiz that you can just be right. certified on and, and be ready to go. How did you adjust and how were you quick to learn on the job? Um, so it was literally, I was thrown into the deep end. Mm. Literally, I stopped sleeping for a while. And at the time, like I was running it from home, which is great because I was around my daughter most of the time. But it's really hard. It yeah. wasn't it wasn't easy to see Touchwood the growth so quickly. It was every day was a learning experience. Like I was on turbo every day in terms of my learning capacity mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's all hands on. But then also understanding the gist of things that if you if you do something that you love really and it's passion based versus just financial base, mm. it has more impact and it's more long term. Yeah. So my product or my brand is not is not commercial mm. and it was never meant to be commercial. So my end goal was never just about monetary. Mm -hmm. It was always about how can I impact those around me? How can I, you know, change their perspective or change their their day, brighten up their day, just even if it's just for a moment. Yeah. How do I create moments or, or these pockets of, of happiness between families and and you know siblings or or, or parents? Mm. So it's just I I was able to to really build this in a very structured way, but I wasn't alone. Mm. So I have an amazing team, mashallah, Touchwood, and I say this, I'm so grateful to them. They are like my family. Mm. So, and the fact is they believe in the mandate. So when you have a team that has an entrepreneurial mindset that actually believes in the mandate, mm -hmm. believes that it's their company, that is worried about every dirham that is spent, that is worried about quality, is worried about what the consumer thinks, listens to what the consumer thinks, mm -hmm. then that is the type of, of team that you, you need to hold on to yeah. and embrace. Mm -hmm. Because when they believe in it so much that they have adopted that founder mentality, Mm -hmm. then they themselves will, you know, will will care for it with their lives, like yeah. literally. And that's what we've built. It's a very flat structure that I have within the Happy Box and the mm -hmm. Happy Studio. It is based on commitment. It's based on trust. It's based on understanding. And it's also at times I, I don't know as much as them, mm -hmm. which is great mm -hmm. because I don't want to be the one to know everything. Yeah. That's why you have a team is to diversify the input the, you know, their, their experience, their mm -hmm. expertise. Um, and yeah, so, and that's how we've kind of had a journey for all these years. It's yeah. been trial and error. Mm. And, yeah. and creating a positive work culture where yes. everyone is genuinely, personally and professionally happy. They feel mm -hmm. valued. But when it comes to being a leader, sometimes you need to make tough decisions. And when you do have such a close team mm -hmm. who you really do consider family mm -hmm. and you're genuinely invested in mm -hmm. them as humans, how do you, where is the line and, and how do you make those decisions? So I, I, like I said, it's a very flat structure. So I've always, um, I've always had a flat structure because I don't like the closed door policy. Mm. I just don't like that at all. Um, I think I was tested a lot during COVID. And I think most founders were tested a lot in COVID. Yeah. And that's where if you were human or not was mm -hmm. assessed. Mm. And that's where tough decisions had to be made at times. And so, like I said, although this is a very for passion, let's say, project or for passion brand, yeah. at the end of the day, when when you have a team that think of it, thinks of it as if it's their own, mm -hmm. they know that it, they need to make it work. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and through that mentality, they put all their effort into actually making it work and finding different ways of plan A doesn't work, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan, you know, mm -hmm. and the list goes on is finding different strategies to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so during COVID, yes, there were decisions that were tough that had to be made, but it was done in collaboration with the team. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. And a lot of the strategizing that happened was with the team. Yes. And that's why we were able to get through one of the most difficult journeys mm. during COVID. And like I said, any company that has survived during COVID can survive anything, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, a pandemic yeah. was the <laughs> was a, the real deal, <laughs> literally. Oh, though, yeah, there was no guidebook to that and how no. to deal with it, was there? No, absolutely not. And I think... And during COVID was when I started my other venture, mm. which is made for you global. Yes. Which I love dearly. Tell, <laughs> tell me more about that because Oh God, made for you is so awesome. Yeah. Um so 
And it was during COVID yeah. because COVID was at the time where, you know, entrepreneurs were speaking to each other about what works. What are you doing? Yeah. What tough decisions are you making? What, you know, how do we make things better? How can we work together to get yeah. through this as well? Mm -hmm. And what I started realizing is that, you know, a lot of the pressure of being both mother and, you know, being at home basically mm -hmm. during that time was put on the female versus mm -hmm. the male. Mm -hmm. So, and this is not dissing men at all. Yeah. It's just that was kind of, you know, the homeschooling that had happened. So a lot of the women that were female founders or actually held a uh, you know, corporate jobs were either let go mm -hmm. or they had to shut down their business or pause it because of the situation. You know, yeah. one thing prioritizes over the other is a priority over the other. And the more that I spoke to female founders or women that wanted to become female founders, the more that I realized that we're, whether you we're here or in Europe, we're all the same. We're all mm -hmm. going through the same aspect, the same kind of situation. Yeah. And that's when I, along with uh, five other really awesome female co-founders, we started Made For You Global. Mm -hmm. So we were incubated under Sharjah government mm -hmm. um, with Shida. Yeah. So with Her Highness, uh, Her Highness Sheikha Boudoud and also Najla Al Madfa mm -hmm. really supported, um, you know, the, the conception, let's say, yeah. uh, of Made For You, mm -hmm. the creation of Made For You. Mm. And it was because of that platform. And this was the first time I take part in an incubator, anything mm -hmm. like that, an accelerator program. But it was really amazing being part of that ecosystem and that support that yeah. you needed, especially mm -hmm. during COVID, yes. where you felt like, OK, if I need more information on this or this or how can I do this better? We were a part of an ecosystem. So made for you in a nutshell, mm -hmm. um, it is a Web3 platform. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we're, we're actually going to be building it on Web3. Right now it's on Web2, mm -hmm. but it is a decentralized networking platform for female entrepreneurs and business leaders. Mm -hmm. And it's designed to connect elevate women and also, you know, get capacity building programs mm. It's designed to really support a woman through her journey. Yes. And 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 it's through this community, which is so beautiful mm. that it has been growing organically that we've we've started to see kind of, you know, the impact of of our gatherings, of our community together, you know, mm. the supportive community that we've built. Mm. Um, and I urge everyone to sign up to be a part of it. It's madeforyouglobal.com. Mm -hmm. um, and it's growing. It's growing by the day. And so we went from kind of this idea of creating uh, a platform to actually really making it happen right yeah. now. And and we tried to reimagine what these networking platforms will look like in the future. And that's why we decided to incorporate a Web3 element to it is how do we make it so decentralized? How do we make it a platform or a community that is owned by everyone, mm. that they want to be a part of it? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. And so it's been a journey of growth. It's been a journey of sisterhood and collaboration and really supporting other women um, to, to reach their potential. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, just listening to you say that, for years I have heard women that I've interviewed, whether it's on this podcast mm -hmm. or other platforms, speak about the lack of support for female entrepreneurs across the world, right? No matter where you're from, it exists. Yeah. And for females to have to come together now to support each other to do yeah. this, what has been the reaction to Made For You so far? I think we've had, honestly, Touchwood, amazing, phenomenal feedback. The reaction has been very positive. Mm. But I have always been, sorry, anti this, this thought yeah. process of victimization mm. of a woman. I don't believe we need to victimize ourselves or... Um, like I said, I'm not really a feminist. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't see this in a bad way at mm -hmm. all. I believe in the power of being a woman, mm -hmm. but I also believe in the power of both genders yes. supporting each other. Yeah. And we complement each other. Mm -hmm. And so even with Made For You Global, we've had a lot of you know, support from men mm -hmm. as well, be it through, you know, their mentorship, through support, through, you know, through opening up doors for us as well. So I don't see it as either or. Yeah. I see it really as a collaborative process. Mm. And although our focus is on women, but it is with the business community and the support of also men as well. Yeah. Um, and it is unfortunate that, you know, you look at the statistics, they, they don't, I mean, they're there. There is an mm. evident gap. Yeah. 
But it's about how do we work towards closing that gap. Yeah. And that is going to take a long time. But we must celebrate yeah. the amazing achievements that women mm. have done in this region. Mm, look at Saudi. Mm -hmm. Look at the UAE. Look at how many women are ministers. Yeah. Look at how many women are educated. How many women are starting their own businesses. Mm -hmm. There's so much to celebrate. Yeah. It's not just a number. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And and. You know, speaking of the future yeah. and where this is heading, there is one thing that you mentioned earlier, which was your personal legacy. Mm -hmm. And so in, in wanting to uh, kind of tie up this episode, I would love to know from you mm -hmm. what you foresee your legacy to be and where you wish it to go. I just, I always say my daughter is my legacy, mm. literally. And I really want to be remembered as a woman who has impacted the world in some way or some form. Mm -hmm. um, and I really hope that I'm able to create a movement of where other women support each other, other men support, you know, women and each other, an ecosystem of growth and, and one that's collaborative. Um, mm -hmm. I really see a beautiful future ahead. I really do. And this is just the beginning. Yeah. Um, so if I'm remembered for doing good, that's all I really care about. Literally. Amazing. Amazing. What a beautiful end to such thank a you. great episode. Jemana, I want to thank you so thank much you so for your much. time. I hope you enjoyed your first ever in-person podcast. I did. I did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for, you for your time. having me. Absolutely. Women in Leadership brought to you by Heron Code, the management consultancy for what happens next. For more information, you can visit heroncode.com.